Hi everyone. We'll use Srila's wonderful book. It's a it's a new publication that has just come out from Duke University Press. I hear that the Indian publication should be out in a, in the course of a year. Uh, we're all very excited for this book, um, and we'll have a more of a freewheeling conversation tonight that is going to stem from the fundamental claims made by this book. And uh, I'm going to the format for the evening will run thus. I will speak uh, about the book, kind of summarizing main issues and uh, for us to take on in our conversation later on. And um, very briefly, I'll take about five to seven minutes to do that. I'll then lend the floor to Shweta, who will take about 12 to 15 minutes to make her arguments. Um, and then to Arvind, who will also take about 12 to 15 minutes. And at the end, I'll wrap up. Uh, and that's how... And, and then we'll, we should have at least half an hour to 40 minutes for, for a Q&A. So without f uh, further ado, let me get started. Uh, Sheila, Sheila Roy's book is called Changing the Subject, Feminist and Queer Politics in Neoliberal India. Um, it, it was uh, based on a long-term ethnography in a city that's very close to my heart, Calcutta. And it's... Uh, and it's uh, uh, based on a, a long conversation, long set of conversations and associations with two organizations, both in Calcutta um, and through, throughout a, a, almost a decade, uh, Sappho for Equality and Janam, as she calls them. And, and the two organizations have different trajectories. They not only have different trajectories um, between the two of them, but they in, in themselves, they start changing, transforming in um, in response to the uh, to the neoliberal turn in India, and this is this is very much uh, it could be called an ethnography uh, of feminist politics and queer politics in neoliberal India. It could be called uh, uh, an ethnography of urban politics in India, uh, politics that's very much concerned with transforming subjectivities um, on on the site of the city of Calcutta. Um, I call it, I like to call it, uh, and which is what I'll speak about a little bit later, an ethnography of public spheres, uh, where publics and subjectivity, public subjectivities are being formed and transformed in response to a set of aspirations. And um, sexuality is one such. Um, a sexual orientation, um, be whatever it is, the, the jargon you might attach it attach to, um, the, the feminist subject or the gendered subject, the, uh, the horizon of expectation that arises, um, across these two organizations whose ethnography she produces, she, she presents in this book, um, are, are of the nature that, um, that are responding to changing aspirations, changing across agrarian and agrarian and urban, changing across queer and heterosexual feminist, changing across the time span of neoliberal India from, from the late 90s up until, up until um, the middle of the 2010s and so on and so forth. Um, Srila presents um, a, a discussion, a Foucauldian discussion, if I might add, of, um, of sort of governmentalizing um, tendencies within the feminist movement. And the feminist movement has been um, accused of or, or bandied about um, for being co-opted. And she takes up that argument head on. And what is co being co-opted by capitalism, by markets, by, uh, you know, neoliberalism, what have you, by governmentalization, etc. What does it all mean? And is co-optation such a bad thing? Who gets to be a real feminist? And that's the real punchline question in this book. And without further ado, and I will now, um, having said all of that, I will uh, hand over to Swetha to take on the theoretical concerns in the book and give us a little more of a freewheeling conversation. Thanks. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation for a range of reasons. I've thought about this book with uh, Swetha in a, a, a different stages of the draft. And one of the main, con the, I don't know if I, I'm poised to give critique of it in terms of I don't know if this is even a valid critique, but my main problem with the book was that it didn't come out when I was writing my own book. Like I read this and I was like, this should have been out when I was writing 
my own book about feminism and I, I logics of identity. I wrote something called Accidental Feminism on, you know, that very question you ended on, right? Which is who gets to be a feminist? How do you think about these terms that are feminist or um, logics of logics of capital, logics of market, logics of identity? Who gets to claim these spaces is a question that I've been struggling with and sort of not having good answers to for a good decade. So it was a gift to read Srila's book and, and come to some of these questions, almost journeying with another book. We call our books like sort of somewhat sibling books that sort of um, premiered first in an MLS symposium that actually was very, very kind to moderate last year. So it's a joy to be back in Bangalore. It's a joy to be in person. It's a joy to sort of think through some of these things. I'm not going to set up the book. Um, I'm going to use the book as a starting point to have a what I hope will be a conversation that we can have together in community with all of you. Um, about some big lingering questions, both about queer movements more generally, but this idea of identity, this idea of like politics, like who gets to claim what, what does it mean by claiming something and who are you speaking on behalf of and how does that change over time? One of the things that um, I find really useful in the book is the way it uses temporality, right? Like this idea, because it's a 10 year ethnography, the book tracks the same kinds of organizations and the questions that they have over time. And when you sit with subjects long enough, you realize that subjects are in motion um, and also that you can't understand subjects entirely. So when you write about anything, you're writing about snapshots. And that brings a question for scholars like us, which is what are we actually saying when we write about a thing? What is the point in time in which we are recording it? And what is the move? I mean, anyone who's written a book knows that it takes like three years between when you write the thing and when it's actually out in someone's hand. And so much changes all the time. So when does it actually stop being the movement? And when does it start becoming your narrative of the movement? Um, two points that I think are important to stay with is this idea of transforming something big with the intimate and the everyday, right? We think of movements as something that's happening way outside and us as merely being observers or participants in it if we have different roles. But what does it mean to do everyday care, everyday intimacy, everyday life as part of a movement? And I think that's a question for um, queer theorists and scholars for sure. But I think anyone that's thinking about um, social change and movements and politics has to consider the logic that things are constantly changing, but that that transformation doesn't happen on the outside. It, it's very often something that you're intimately connected to. And, and, and the second sort of idea that I think comes up in the book that I hope we have a chance to discuss is this idea of care and critique, right? We think of critique as always something that's angry, something that's in opposition to. And what does it look like to think about critique with more care? Like, what does it look like to actually ask questions that are critical, that get to the point of it? But how do we do feminist and queer methodology about writing, about thinking, about politics, about movements with more care? Any, I mean, anyone that's had a hard conversation, especially around the holidays with anyone that they don't fully agree politically with, knows that most conversations end up with the other person just not listening to you, right? So how do you actually be part of movements? How do you build within movements? How do you stay intimate in movements while doing the critique of care? And I think that's a hard question to ask and it's a hard question to sit with because it's easy talking to folks that already agree with you. And the harder question is like, what does it look like? What do movements look like for queer movement building and queer making when it's built and structured around care and critique or care as critique. Um, the, the, the three themes that I think shine in the book is sort of the first, the first big theme that shines in the book for me is this idea of self-making and remaking, right? So across the book, organizations make and remake themselves. Uh, movements make and remake themselves. The queer movement makes and remakes itself. Who the main actors are changes what the actual causes are changes. And then the people who are very much on the radical end become part of the center. The periphery starts to become the core. What does it mean to actually make and reshape movements over time is a question of the book. Actually, if you haven't picked it up yet, I would really urge you to read it because it does a really good job of engaging with that question of fashioning yourself around your identity and when those limits of that identity making are. Um, and, and sort of a related point is this idea of transformation, right? So everyone transforms over period of, periods of time. And Calcutta, as you say, is like a sieve with which to see it. You look at the city and the city transforms over the 10 year period that this happens. But then the market transforms around it. So that one point, you know, uh, Srila's book says, you know, beyond the law, there's an invisible hand of where the queer economy is hopping. And so there are all these examples of how you know, there's, you can read it as pink washing, but the truth is it's actually hopping in ways that reaches the average consumer 
in ways that perhaps, you know, me sitting in a law school teaching a queer theory class, which I do every year, every semester, I'm not doing the same reach too. So then what does it mean to do everyday mainstream queer making and unmaking? And what does that have to do with movements? What's the role that has with movements is, is a sort of second strain that I hope we can somewhat engage with. Um, the, the third is sort of queer as a category beyond sexual choice, right? I think we hear the word queer and we think, okay, this is sexual minorities. Let's put them in the LGBTQ plus bracket if, you know, or, or whatever it is the acronym is at the point in the movement. But queer as a way of thinking about alterity, queer as a way of thinking about just others who are not part of normativity, especially beyond Western definitions of what queer is, could actually serve us in thinking about inclusion better and more expansively and differently. And one of the great things that I think the book does is that it positions queerness as a possibility of the self, right? So it's this idea that um, if you do something that's ulterior to heteropatriarchal logics, whatever that might be, what would that queer making and remaking look? And I'm, and I'm thinking of specific examples in the book, which is, you know, this idea of like lesbian couples who live together but for whom it is assumed that it is fair that they live together because they must be just friends, right? Because the, the idea is that, of course, that, that falls within the market logic of what it means to do one kind of community. So it's visible invisibility. And the second strain that the book carries on that I think is really important for, you know, queer scholars, thinkers, and workers to think through is what does it mean to do this along with logics of caste and class, right? So the book really takes that head on in terms of what's the rural versus urban, but also what is the caste logics and the class logics that make things qu more queer and less queer or visibly queer and less visibly queer in different contexts. And how do we actually deal with that as those of us working with and alongside and adjacent to the movement? And, and I want to stop there because I know, you know, I hope this goes back and forth. Um, but, but really this idea of like, it's, it, it might be easier for a Savarna sort of upper caste person or a, a forward, you know, upper middle class person to do what is clear or obvious as queer in some contexts. Um, but in a way, it sort of takes away that version of what queer as subversive might be if it's not doing it within logics that are also intersectional and interactional with other logics that they may be situated with. So I'm going to I'm going to sort of stop there as just starting jumping off points. But I'm really excited to be here and to chat with the two. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was thinking that uh, the way to think about this book is what does it do for me coming from the position that I do, right? One part of the position I come from is maybe as a queer activist, as a queer lawyer. And what does this book do? What are the questions it raises? What are the, what are the challenging issues it poses? Why is it a book I must engage with? What are the questions which are there, right? And I just want to talk about two issues which the book raises and see what relevance it has for the, for the debate which we're having now, which is the marriage issue, right? That's the big, big issue which we're all, which we're all in the middle of. The, what the book, uh, two concepts the book puts forward, uh, the many concepts which my colleagues have already put forward, but the two concepts I will focus on is what uh, she calls queer governmentality and what she calls a queer practice of the self, a queer self fashioning, right? And the two, in a sense, map onto queer activism and just queer people's lives, just ordinary people's lives, right? And so that's the dimension of the, or the, or the, or the polarity or the tension which really sets up. When you say queer governmentality, what she means, and this is, a, this is something for activists to reflect upon, what she's saying is, it's great that your guys are activists. I'm putting it in slightly more colloquial fashion. It's great that your guys are activists. But what you should also recognize is that you have a certain form of governance of the self. That is, you're putting forward ideas which, in a sense, force people around you to work within your frame. So you're not innocent of the operation of power. If there's a younger person who comes to comes within your circle and you're putting forward the idea, for example, within the queer circle, that marriage is a normative institution. Why do you believe in marriage? Right? I put forward that idea. Then the younger person either says I accept and agree with you, or is dismissed forever from my from my society. Right? And that's in a sense, I'm I'm paraphrasing a little bit, and maybe I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's in a sense a critique of marriage. She gives one example which which puts it very clearly. Uh, Again, right, the distinction between activism and in a sense the broader community, right? And what the example she puts forward is two people, uh, decide to get married and they decide to advertise their marriage on Facebook and they put forward 
the in, in, in the Hindu rituals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the activists take issue with that. They say, you know, you're getting married within Hindu rituals and traditions, the reinforcing ideas of Hindu, Hinduism, Hindutva, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they have a, a, a slanging match, as it were, on, on Facebook, da, da, da. But the point of the story is this, right? Uh, the person, the, the just the person who's not an activist, responds to saying, "Hey, you know, I'm leading my life. Who the hell are you to tell me what I should do with my life?" Right, and that's the that's the response. So that's the question of queer governmentality and the problems with it. But of course, the, we know the the positives of it, right? I mean, again, think of it from the point of view of an activist. If you're an activist, what is it you want to do? You want to change the world, right? You want to put forward a certain vision of what's the problem with marriage, and that's that's what you want to do. So somebody is accusing you of governmentality. So be it would be one kind of response from an activist perspective, right? That's one one viewpoint. The other viewpoint which she puts forward is the idea of what she calls queer. Uh, self-fashioning. She says that in this larger climate of one one version which activists are putting forward, there are a range of queer people leading their lives in the current moment of neoliberalism, in the common, current moment of capitalism, and they're not all complicit in neoliberalism. That's her, that's her point. In the sense that the larger structure of neoliberalism may be there, but people find their ways and the spaces to challenge and, and challenge some of the essential uh, normative institutions, be it family, be it marriage, be it, uh, be it the state or be it the market, right? And that's, that's the viewpoint she's putting forward. So, for example, what she says is, uh, assuming you're a young queer person today and, uh, you decide to have a, you're in a relationship with, with another person, with another queer person, you're two women as, uh, as you put it, living, 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 living in a house somewhere, right? Just by the fact that you two, your two guys are living together, you end up challenging a range of assumptions. What is family? What is marriage? And a range of uh, normative assumptions. And her point is, she's telling the activists, guys, look there. They're doing something which is important. Don't live within your own own uh, own cyclical world and assume that you're the you're God's gift to mankind. And activism. The people that are actually doing activism in their own way. So get get a life. Is, is, I'm being very very facetious, but yeah, that that's that's broadly the point that she's making. Right? And so to get it back again, like she gives the example, right? I mean, this I think is a tension or challenge. I mean, Calcutta is one example. I mean, I'm taking it beyond Calcutta because I think it's true in any queer space, right? You go to Bangalore, you'll find a similar tension. You'll find activists think in a certain way. You'll find the larger community may have a different way of thinking. And there's sometimes a tension, which is which, between these two ways of thinking, right? And that's that's the viewpoint that she's uh, really uh, putting forward. So the uh, yeah, I think the question, I think the question, which okay, again, my my sense, again, you since all of you guys have read the book, maybe correct me if I you think I've got it wrong. Uh, my sense is she's a, it's a very caveated, very nuanced book, saying that you know these are the positives here, these are the positives on this side, the problems with queer self fashioning, the problems with queer governmentality, and and so you get a sense that okay, where is she now? What actually is she thinking? That's a question which is there in the back of my mind. And my my response to that, I would think where she's where she falls on the point is I think end of the day she is somewhere falling on the line that you know with all its problems, she believes that queer self fashioning is the way forward. Right, and she makes the point that uh, she has a particular problem. I mean, again, I think a problem. I mean, no, I mean, she's not here, so we shouldn't be saying that she, she, she. But I, I'm saying that the the larger issue. Let's raise the larger issue, right? The larger issue which she is raising is the entire question of you know how do you uh, uh, the question of the collective self. Again, our three reference to the entire point is feminism or queer politics, or any form of politics is founded on the idea of the collective, right? We go out on the street and we march, we demonstrate, we get together and we discuss, we try and bring about changes in the world around us. That's, that's the way we do things, right? And her point is that, you know, what you've ignored is the individual often resists and functions in their own way. My response to that is, yes, that's true. But unless you're able to respond to the larger structures, you limit your, you will work within those existing structures, whether you like it or not. I'll give maybe an example from slightly outside the queer, the queer sphere, which is if you read, for example, uh, a book such as say Thomas Piketty's Capital and Ideology, right? Okay, it's a very fascinating book, but the point that he's making is that uh, there is a link between the larger question of economics and culture, right? The point he's making again, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating book which traces the, the history of the world from 1914 onwards. 
right to the right to the right to the contemporary times. And the point that he's making, sorry, right from the French Revolution to now, and the point that he's making is that the moment of highest inequality the world experienced was between the French Revolution to the time of the First World War. Right? And, and the point is obvious, right? What did the high levels of inequality resulted in? It resulted in the rise of Hitler. It resulted in the rise of, uh, of, of fascism. It resulted in a sense, the crisis the world spiraled into, right? So I, I think the point is, if you look at it from that perspective, there's a fundamental space for looking at the question of the collective. There's a fundamental space for looking at the question of the economic. You can't say queer self-fashioning is the answer to the problems of the world would be my response. I'll say, I mean, I, if, again, there's a debate. Again, we're not having the debate with her, but this is a debate I think with all of you guys. Maybe someday has a different perspective. We can, we can look at that, right? That's one view. But the other question, if I have a couple more minutes, I'll just, I'll just quickly raise it is, okay, fine. How do we apply her way of thinking? The, the, of, again, again, these two concepts, queer governmentality and queer self-fashioning to the current debate, right? The entire question of the entire question of marriage debate, which is which is on us, whether we like it or not, it's on us. Because Supreme Court is taking up the matter, the matter is going to come up upon us, right? And again, here, right, from a from the, the viewpoint she's putting, uh, the viewpoint of queer activism, right, of a certain kind. Again, not all kinds, queer activism of a certain kind. Uh, there's a problem with the normativity of the institution of marriage. So the critique of the institution of marriage. So you'd say that, hey, you know, we don't want to function within this institution. Can we think of other forms of uh, other forms of relationship recognition. I think it's a very fair and very, very important point. But the the question which will come up, I think the question which comes up to me is that is, uh, again, the queer governmentality question. Are there other ways people are thinking about the marriage question? Is it true that the marriage, that marriage or same marriage of uh, between uh, uh, same sex couples or uh, transgender people and others is something which is important only as far as elite gay men and lesbians are concerned. Right? And again, if you do a bit of an ethnography, in my senses, you will find that people across the board, people in many class and caste traitors are actually interested in the question of marriage. Right? You'll find that even you speak to an, or speak to a, to just a person who's not a part of the activist circle, they'll say, no, you know, I think it's important as far as I'm concerned. If they're important, they'll, they'll articulate the importance. And that's a sense I've had. Again, I'm happy to be corrected by anybody else over here. In terms of the, uh, it's not an issue, in my opinion, which is, which is restricted to a certain class or a certain elite state, right? I think the representation of the issues is, rep is, is limited as of today. But I think the issue has a wider resonance, which of course can take you back to the question. There's a lot more work to be done, right? You, how do you challenge the normative structure? It's not as simple as saying that, you know, we think it's a problem there, but saying, how do you, get people to believe in the idea of alternatives to the question of marriage. I think it's a challenging question that has to be done, but I don't think uh, we're there as yet. So perhaps this one last point I'll end with is the entire question of, uh, if you say, if you look at the marriage question through the question of queer commentality and the queer fashioning of the self, I think we'll have many answers to that question. We'll have answers from the community, we'll have answers from activists, answers from Answers from a range of groups. And again, I'll make one, one last point on this, actually. And often the question is raised, you know, I mean, uh, what, what should the next priority of the queer movement be after decriminalization? And activists have very good responses, and I think very valid and legitimate responses, which is, obviously, the question of discrimination is an important one. In workspaces is very, very important. In schools is very, very important. Look at the entire question, right? I mean, till now, I mean, if you ask the question, why? are the majority of transgender people, right? Especially uh, hijras. Why are they with low levels of education? Most of them may not have passed out of school. You ask the question, you speak to them, the answer you'll get is this. You'll say that, you know, they've all been pushed out of school, right? So because of the question of being gender non-conformative in school, you get pushed out of school. So it's a significant, deeply important issue, right? And that's an activist response. And I, I'm completely with that response, saying, hey, you know, these are our priorities. I mean, we need to look at these issues. But the point is, not everybody thinks like that. I think like that, not everybody thinks like that. And the debate on marriage tells you that, because in any part of the world, you look at it, uh, somewhere, once decriminalization happens, some couple somewhere will file a petition saying, we want to get married. And that's the nature of things. So it's not something, when the movement is not something A, B, or C controls, right? It's wider than A, B, or C. So somebody will file a petition, which is what the case in, in today's context. People have filed petitions. 
people feel the importance of the institution. We can ask the question, why? Why do people feel marriage is important? You look at the petition, the articulation will be that uh, either the entire question of uh, the entire question of rights, civil civil rights, which you get on marriage, that could be one kind of language. The other is the question of equality. People feel very strongly the sense of humiliation and indignity, which is put on them by saying that, hey, we can't get married, right? We, we want to access the institution of equals. Equality is the norm people, people articulate quite strongly as well. So I think there are a range of reasons why marriage becomes important as far as uh, people are concerned. But activists have a very different perspective on that. And the two perspectives don't always meet. And that's the, that's the, I think, the challenging place we're in today, right? I think the marriage debate has gone forward in the absence of a movement at the ground level. Right? Again, I get the, again, one, two, two more points I can make on the marriage question. Yeah. Uh, is, I mean, we also have to understand the marriage debate in the context of India. If you've seen yesterday's statement by Sushil Kumar Modi, uh, he makes it very clear. He says marriage is not a part of a culture. It's no, it's something for the elite westernized groups. It's something we will oppose no matter what. So it's very clear that the current government is going to oppose you tooth and nail on the marriage question, which gets you back to the question of why are they going to oppose you tooth and nail on the marriage question? If it's a normative institution and, and it, the, there should be no problem with that. The answer is really that. I mean, I think marriage in the Indian context, we look at marriage in terms of the Hindu marriage act, which could be a marriage between, between people within the same religious community or the other personal laws. But the Special Marriage Act has a very different history. The history of the Special Marriage Act is it emerges as a response to the fact that people can't marry across the lines of caste and religion. Special Marriage Act is meant to enable you to marry across the lines of caste and religion imperfectly at present. So I would see the same-sex marriage debate in India today as a continuation of the radical potential of the Special Marriage Act. So we're challenging some fundamental norms that marriage is really about the right to love, is marriage is really about crossing the lines of caste, religion, gender, and sexuality. And therefore, I think the marriage debate is an important one. And I don't think it's going to be an easy victory either, right? because you saw the response of the government. I think it's going to be a hard fought one. And we don't have a campaign on the ground as of now. So it's something that I think we should think a little more about and seeing how do you want to, how does, how do communities and groups get involved and activists get involved in the question of same-sex marriage. I think that's that, uh, or queer marriage. I put it queer marriage because it's broader than same-sex marriage. And perhaps the last point, as I end with the very, very last point, is the representation question. As of now, look at the representation of the marriage question. It is undoubtedly, it's elite, right? Undoubtedly, it's kind of uh, elite lesbian gay representation is what we have, by and large, right? So I think there's a space for intervention, the petitions, which make the case why same-sex, mar why marriage is important from the transgender community, from the F2M community, from a range of communities which are otherwise not represented. So you change the representation logic a uh, little bit. I'll end with that, yeah. And Sarvi, do you want to respond? Yeah. Okay. I have two points, but I can take one. Okay. Um, yeah. So if I can, following from what uh, Arvind said, if I can take the debate and the conversation a little bit away from sexuality to uh, the question of politics, the question of public spaces and public spheres, and the question of activism. There's a story, there's an anecdote in the book um, which, which relates to a, a young woman uh, openly writing on a Facebook page of an organization, I need bhalo basha, I need love, okay? And, and the organization is a little bit um, keen to censure her saying that this organization's uh, Facebook page is made, made, made for political debates or conversations about queer solidarity, etc., queer politics. Uh, it's not a space for you to come and uh, look for love. But the, I want to start with this, um, this anecdote to, to show a kind of um, public proclamation for love that uh, takes on the value of a political comment. Uh, that that statement, to my mind, is a political comment. Um, she's she's uh, and she's looking for queer love. She's she's uh, she, I think I think she's a, a woman identified person and looking for um, for love in another woman and uh, making that very clear. And she says uh, in that conversation on Facebook that I don't have any other spaces to go and look for love. And then Facebook becomes a productive, generative space to start this kind of queer public sphere. Um, 
to remember and regurgitate very briefly, um, Jürgen Habermas, uh, the German philosopher, gives us the language of public spheres as a, pl a place where uh, publicly citizens come out and have something called critical rational debate. You know, you and I can, can go to a pub or a cafe or a newspaper column or a Facebook page. These are all public spheres where I can say this is what I think and this is why I think so. And you can say this is what I think and this is why I think so. And we can battle it out among ourselves through a critical rational modality, um, which is invariably uh, its history, at least the Habermas traces it from the 18th century, is uh, an essentially bourgeois modality of expression, of thinking, of uh, making oneself, oneself individuated. You come out of your community collective fold and you become individuated in the public sphere. You become one person who thinks, who thinks and talks about themselves. What I think, what I uh, want to argue, what I uh, want to put forth before the state and the public sphere that therefore becomes also a place where citizens argue with the state. Um, and, and this kind of uh, formulation then becomes helpful uh, through the work of, I, um, I don't know if he's known in this hall, uh, Michael Warner, who's a queer, queer uh, theorist, uh, writes uh, a famous book called Counterpublics, Publics and Counterpublics. And uh, in this formulation about counterpublics, he says that the queer public take on this um, rationale, this uh, um, modality of being public and make it their own. And this is what this woman is doing here on that Facebook page. She's, she's preferring, she's opening up a counter public. It's, it's that same Facebook page which is saying, saying the admin is saying, please, um, you know, don't kind of cruise here. This play, page is very serious and it's meant for your, um, you know, regular kind of queer political and academic conversations and for solidarity making and things like that. Uh, this is not a place for you to fool around. And she, she goes and jolly well fools around. And um, that's what makes me think. Uh, the second thing I want to say was that um, sex perhaps always already was a pedagogic project. Um, we've always had either some kind of, you know, Kama Sutra type you know, rendition of sex, which is saying, oh, these are th thousand different things you can do by way of sex. Uh, someone else came, coming and saying, you know, from the conservative side, that, oh, it must be only within, within marriage or within kind of heterosexual logics um, for, for kind of childbearing purposes and so on and so forth. We usually religious, religious orthodoxies and, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. But the modality, the, the method is always of, of uh, a number of people coming and telling the sexual subject how best you can be sexual and which marries with what um, Arun was saying earlier. Who am I to go and tell someone, um, hey, marriage is really, it's a bad thing. You know, you, you're a queer person. In your ideal, ideal type of your queer personality, you must not look for marriage. You must not look for uh, to be in a, in a uh, fashion, fashion ad which is featuring some queer persons, which also is, is something she discusses in the book that... Uh, you know, it, the consumerization of the, the cafe coffee deization of queer publics, that, that uh, queer dates are increasingly happening, not at the community hall, community center of this organization, which used to be the case in the 80s and the 90s. But now uh, uh, two queer people or three queer people or four uh, will jolly well go to a cafe coffee day uh, and, and, or, 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 a, or a reasonably priced bar to meet other queer people. And, um, and, and there's a critique to be made of that, which is that it is buying into a certain kind of consumer logic. It's getting mainstreamed. Queer mainstreaming is a term we often, uh, find and we often, uh, are, are hearing in, in, in this milieu. Um, but what of the person who, um, actively participates in wanting things, um, like a, a pair of, uh, very, uh, you know, hip Zara trousers, uh, being a woman who's never been allowed to wear those kinds of trousers and uh, wanting this kind of queer ex expression through buying, say, clothes from H&M or, or Zara. Um, of course, they're, they're completely walking into the trap of a 
consumer subjectivity and, and a market logic. I don't, I don't doubt that. But to marry with what, what Arvind was saying earlier, uh, if they're, they're expressing some horizon of desire to, um, to express, to, to, um, to self-fashion themselves through, you know, mall clothes or designer clothes or, or a date at a, at a fancy cafe, um, that's just as well. And that can be queer too. And um, there's a certain kind of, um, and this is, I think, this is where Calcutta speaks in the book. And, and I want to say a little bit about that. Um, because of its kind of strong um, leftist puritanism, uh, there's a certain kind of um, tendency among Calcutta political publics um, and some organizations sometimes um, to say, um, oh, oh, that's too kind of snazzy. You know, don't become this kind of fashionable queer. Don't become this kind of, um, you know, market friendly queer where after all, good old lefties. Um, and that left kind of uh, has left a, uh, if I can call it um, a favorite pun of mine, is, is it's, it's left a kind of leftover politics. And that leftover politics, sorry, sorry, bad one. Sorry, I take it back. Um, and that leftover politics kind of marries with uh, various kinds of feminist, queer, uh, environmental movements, other kinds of uh, human rights and rights-based movements uh, to say that the movement must not be co-opted at any rate by forces of capital. And like Arvind said earlier, uh, a movement is not dictated by A, B and C person, right? It's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem that does not, that one cannot, A, B and C cannot determine its coordinates or its boundaries of at any given point in time. It may become at that, at that corner, the movement may become very capitalist. At this corner, the movement become kind of Maoist. The, uh, you know, it, all kinds of things may happen in this ecosystem. It's not for any one person uh, to take ownership or authorship of that movement. Um, and lastly, um, I, I want to say a little bit um, about the activist as a public figure. The activist is something India is, you know, I mean, if you trace it back, the, the activist genealogy to the national movement, you will find that they were all activists, you know, I mean, persons who were, who were um, Gandhian, Nehruvian, whatever, uh, participating in the national movement and did not have a salaried job, didn't have um, uh, to pay taxes or, or whatever, and usually came from wealth, usually came from somewhat elite families so that they could do this kind of 24-7 um, activism work and so on and so forth. So, so from that genealogy, activism as a profession is very much a 90s, post-90s phenomenon where you can earn a living and pay taxes and and um, you know send your children to decent schools um, if you by while being an, a twenty four seven activist as a professional um, and that is the the, um, the trajectory of activism as a as a form of public philanthropy to a kind of professionalism uh, which we have to consider that it was I'm not saying one is good and the other is bad I wouldn't do that. But um, but this kind of philanthropic kind of magnanimous activist figure who comes to the public space and say, I give my labor and my thought um, to this cause for, for my life. And and then there's this other person who's a, who's a post 90s activist professional who says, I give everything to this cause, but I take home a salary. Um, what what are the tensions between the two? If there are at all any tensions, um, let me just wrap up. Um, and, 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 and throw the floor open to, to both of you for, for your comments before we go on to the Q&A. Um, saying saying um, this pedagogic project that I started with uh, is something that is of interest to me. We are always teaching as, um, as intellectuals, as activists, as government bureaucrats, as NGO professionals, where we are always finding one person who is to be rescued from uh, not living the ideal politics. So it becomes our job, you know, this in the spectrum, the intellectual, the activist, the NGO professional, the bureaucrat or whatever else. Uh, it becomes their job. They take it on their skin that I must be this person who is coming, who is going to come and tell you, hey, that's not the way to be left. 
hey, that's not the way to be queer. I'll teach you how to be the real queer. I'll teach you how to be the real feminist. I'll teach you how to be the real leftist. And uh, that pedagogic project is not peculiar to sexuality politics. That pedagogic project is, peculiar, is, is fundamental to politics it, itself. Politic, politics presents itself as a pedagogic project. And sex um, in, in that ballpark is definitely, um, in the, the history of sex is a pedagogic project. I think the Foucauldians in the room might, might agree with me there. Um, and it's something to think about. Uh, can we not, can we present a different form of politics, which is not pedagogy, right? When we're not kind of, you know, keep giving people a rap on the knuckle for not being the best kind of political personality that they could have been, I'll stop there. Yeah. So I want to pick up a strain that actually came up in both of your nodes, right? So Arvind, you set it up as a, is it a debate? You use the word debate to say, is this, you know, is something that's happening at the movement level and the individual level? And I don't want to speak on Sreela's behalf, right? Like even if we've all read the book, but this is that it's not that's not the point of the fashioning. But I thought of it as much more recursive, which is that you know movements take certain stances, and then individuals, in a range of ways, self-fashion to actually change what the original logic of that stance is, which then goes back to the movement. So it's like a constant. Each needs to witness the other for that recursive process to happen, right? So if you think of it as a debate, we fall into the same trap of heteropatriarchy, which is this crazy dichotomy that we none of us signed up for. It's if, if you make it an either or and you say it's either it's either governmentality that is the problem or the self-fashioning that is the problem. I think we lose an opportunity to think of queer movements as much more recursive, as much more um, dependent on each other at these various levels of analysis. Right. And that to me was the opportunity in the book. Right. This way of thinking of. How do we look past like pointing fingers at the movement for not doing this right or saying, oh, I can't believe you bought Zara trousers, shame on you, right? But actually recognize that all of them are reinforcing each other to make this pie larger and that the scarcity that says you only get one piece of that pie is not made by queerness. That is made by a straight project that was handed down to us that we have somehow convinced ourselves has to be an either or. But perhaps it doesn't need to be. Maybe we can all have ice cream. I mean, I'm lactose intolerant. But, you know, there's like a version of this where all of us can have the cake, right? Or, or, or to me, that was, the, that was the possibility in the book. That was the queer project to me that felt, um, th that felt available for those of us that want to actually not care about the structure. That things, I don't care who you're pointing fingers at. That pointing fingers has a job in the puzzle. And the person that says, screw you, you can point fingers all you want. I'm still going to, I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't swear this is getting recorded. But okay, but like this, you know, that that recursive project to me uh, was where the potential was. And I found that as a breaking of the dichotomy that I feel we are so stuck in, right? And you use the, the this, if I, if I could just two more points that I have. The second is sort of this, all of us seem to have spoken about fashioning and self-fashioning and queer movements. And I, and I, I'm as, you know, um, I, I have to apologize for this as much as anyone else, which is that we think of conjugality or sexual logics or even marriage, right? Like marriage is the traditional concept is one level of thinking about it. I actually think of the sexual contract as the starting point of queer politics as actually problematic. Like we forget, you know, A gets added into that logic, but we really don't think of asexual logics as part of sexual uh, as part of like sort of queer movements expansively in the mainstream literature right so there's ways in which all the outcomes that we're thinking of are still predicated on a specific kind of conjugal contract or the possibility of a conjugal possibility and and and, and there's not as much expansive sort of back and forth and, I, and I, i'm just putting that on the table as thinking about maybe one way i mean to your question of like how do we break open this marriage question right like maybe to think about family of choice as queers have way before. I mean, it's not like we're responding to this and saying, oh, we can't have marriage. Let's find other ways in which we can make community. The traditional queer contracts have been in community, in collectives, in ways of seeing and knowing and holding and making each other that have transcended the logic of marriage, right? So I think there's both possibility in saying, I can't believe you're settling for marriage and the queer person that says, I'm sorry, like, but that actually, this is the bread I want. And so who are you to tell me I can't have dal chawal? I want it, right? And both those things, I think, is doing some work there that I find actually really promising. And the last point I want to make is this idea of co-option, I think, that you, that you sort of started to speak about, right? Which is, which I think speaks to the first point on who is this book talking to and who should we be talking to, which is, you know, all of us on the left, right? Or, or on the far left or leftover, whatever this is, right? <laughs> we think of co-option as, um, 
as done by capital, as done by market, as done by institutions, as done by patriarchy, whatever it is, right? But I think one of the things that I enjoyed about the book was that it actually turned that on us and said, actually, co-option is being done by you too, right? So th there's a way in which it is pointing fingers to places that otherwise might have thought they were not deserving of such pointing. And there's something useful there too, which is how do we think about whose co-option is at stake? How do we think of that co-option as actually both problematic and generative, right? Like how do we actually build a queer politic that uses and more than either or? Because then there might be a possibility there that we can move forward with, I don't know, collectively in community with each other. I'll, I'll stop there because I'm really excited to hear the question. Thank you. I think that uh, those are very, very useful comments. I tend to agree with you that that's the, the direction one really wants to. I think the way you framed it in the end, right? That uh, queer politics should be and rather than all. It's a beautiful way of really phrasing it. And that's really what it should be. It should be a space for the diversity of opinions, which should really find the space within this, uh, this larger, we want to call it larger kind of a uh, queer, queer project as it were. Uh, yeah, the, and I think the, the way you framed it again as the potentiality which the book gestures to, I, th I think is the right way to put it, right? And that's not what is the current, what is currently happening, but that's the direction which you, you should think of going. That's the, that's the way I read, uh, I read your, uh, your, 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 uh, your response. And one tends to agree with that. Uh, the, the only other point I'd add, maybe I'm not, I'm not too sure if I'm responding actually. Is this entire question of uh, conjugality, sexual contract? Where do we see this? Where do we see this entire debate? Uh, I would look at it again in the. If you go back to the Navtej judgment, one of the what Justice uh, Chandrachud says, he says the right to love is not just a right for the LGBT community; it's a right for all of us. And what he means by that is you understand the word unnatural in three hundred and seven. Very differently in the Indian context. Unnatural in the Indian context is not just relationships across lines of sex and sexuality. It's also relationships across lines of religion and caste. And why that becomes so central today, again, why I think, I, where I see the radical potential in the sense of the, of the relationality and of the conjugality question is today, relationality and conjugality is criminalized in the Indian context. Right. And the simple, the simple example you have is in the state we come from. I mean, uh, all of you here should know. I mean, I hope you know that the, the current law, the freedom of religion law basically criminalizes what it calls the, uh, the, 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 con the contract to, to marry, right? Uh, if it's premised on the idea of forcible conversion, right? And so the, again, if you ask the question, who is it targeting? Is basically targeting those who want to marry across lines of religion, right? So in this, I mean, you very, very clearly, we have seen recent cases that people who have decided to marry across lines of religion get targeted under this particular law. And what are they getting targeted for? For an exercise of the right to love. That's the, that's the core right which has been criminalized today. So marriage in the Indian context actually has, in my opinion, in terms of both the question of caste and religion, and of course, the question of increasingly it'll come to same sex questions as well. The, the, the radical potential of challenging structures of caste and religion and, and increasingly state and nationalism, right? I mean, the question of nationalism indicates that you can't cross this boundary because there's a certain kind of a hegemonic nationalism that says that no, this is the way you must be, right? So the freedom of religion laws, be it in India, be it in UP, has that dimension to it. That's at the level of the law. But at the level of the unwritten law, which again is very, very important, you go back to, uh, uh, Bitko's work. The point he makes again is, I mean, uh, what is the law in India? There's a very uh, fantastic lecture by Bal Gopal actually. He's given the topic caste and law. And he makes one simple point, and that, that's one, one line. He says, in India, caste is the law. So the idea that the informal, informal contract, if you want to call it, the customary contract, which prohibits this, this crossing of the boundaries of caste, is the law in India. Again, people who choose to cross those boundaries, often get killed for it. And recently we had a number of cases in the Karnataka context which are witnessing a range of violations of this. So again, I mean, we would go back to, I think, right, the principle that you defend the right to freedom of choice, defend the right to, in a sense, in this question of, I think the broader principle of fraternity, the right to cross the boundaries of religion and caste, 
and you defend really the right to dis disrupt the social status quo through relationality. So I think again, relationality and conjugality, I think is the heart of the, the political project today or the defense of relationality and conjugality is at the heart of the, the political project in the, in the Indian context today. Yeah, so shall we open it up to the, the audience for Q&A? Thanks. We've spoken a fair bit about uh, normativity or sort of abiding by norm. I'm wondering if you could say more about assimilation or the terms on which we belong. Because as you were speaking, I was sort of thinking of a contrast. Say in the West, there's a lot of talk of, say, the death of the gay bar or the domestication of drag queens. Neoliberalism sort of follows this trajectory along which um, people retreat from the public sphere, um, sort of common goods become privatized, etc. We don't quite follow the same trajectory. So uh, my question is in two parts. One, um, how useful really are these terms when we're thinking about very different kinds of um, configurations of capital, mm -hmm. one. And two, um, um, say for example, I'm, I'm a young person, right? And uh, five years ago, so much, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, f f five years ago, I think even for people of my generation, a lot of our um, public space where people socialized, uh, where you found love or sex or all of that, did happen in these movement spaces. For many people, that was the public sphere. And I think that's, that's changing now, right? I mean, queer people sort of find ways to socialize that are not these movement spaces. So is it also really a meaningful distinction to think of a wider public sphere as distinct from you know, NGOs, protests, um, queer and feminist movements. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's very clear, but who parts to that question? Thank you. So the, I, I might start with your second question first, which is like, what is the public sphere changing as? And I think one of the strains in the book that we didn't really speak a lot about is the way in which the digital transformation of the public sphere is actually making the access to it very different, like distinctly different, uh, although now Twitter's dying, so who knows, right? Like, but but there, there's ways in which um, precarity and closeness and possibility of making individual space has changed quite dramatically. You're right. Even in the last five or 10 years, it's changed quite distinctly. And movements are made in intimate contact. That was one of the first comments I made, right? Which is that you don't think of it as something that's happening on the outside. It's happening in private one-on-one -on -one collaboration and conversation. And I do think the digital transformation of that sphere has, has had some implications for it. Um, your first question is like, how useful are these terms, right? I think it's a really important question. Just this idea of like, who is it serving to call these things a new theoretical prospect, right? Like as someone that teaches theory, I think about this fairly often, is not is it really just for self, right? Is it self-fashioning to call something specific when in fact those terms don't translate? And I think those of us that think about transnational movements more specifically um, have had to consider this quite you know, over time, right? Like in terms of, is this actually um, meaning the same thing, right? So with marriage, I love that. And it actually, it, it, you know, it attaches to that last explanation you gave us, which is marriage is a radical prospect, changes within the context of the country that you're actually studying it in, right? So if you just read it as a construction that you're searching for as straight equality, which is strategic choice, it's actually unstrategic choice in this case because it's actually not politically convenient to make that choice. So I, I think that question of like claiming and naming and categories, which again is a theme in the book, I, I, I think you're onto something there in terms of thinking through who is this serving um, because it, it complicates that analysis. Yeah, me too. Shall I? Okay. Um, yeah. So on the on the wider public sphere question, um, I think that the spatial expanse of the public sphere is less important um, to consider at this point. Where you you know as you're as you're explaining that the movement space used to be the public sphere, and now there's a wider kind of spatial density to the various kinds of queer public spheres that are available, but. Um, um, the the public sphere is a, is a is a is is not just a space. It's not just a spatial um, like that that metaphor. The sphere metaphor is misleading there. Um, it's a place where I can perform a certain individuated self, um, come out of this kind of um, you know community fold, collective fold, and and put forth my um, you know my thoughts, my desires, my arguments in an individuated form. 
and that can be very much you know like she was pointing out uh, they were pointing out the um, the digital um, the 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 propensity to seek a fulfillment of desire through a um, facebook post or an instagram or a tiktok video um, is very much i mean that's where i see um, a certain kind of peak if i may put it um queer public right um that that one that uh, is not afraid to um make oneself weird make oneself um publicly weird and and that doesn't need a cabin park that doesn't need a community hall that doesn't need a cafe coffee day um and it's happening um i i don't know whether it's liberating or or not or whether it's a generational change but um yeah i'll stop there yeah so no, thanks thanks for those two uh, questions and uh, just to build on what both of you guys have put out till now and why and atre's point of this public sphere and the word sphere is misleading and the word public i gathered is what you, what you're saying is important and i was thinking of it from the point of view again what is a what is a public space and why is it important right why is a what you are indicating why is a protest space important why is a place for community for larger deliberation important i would go back to again uh, this uh, arrange distinction where she makes the distinction in origins of totalitarianism between what she calls solitude loneliness and isolation and isolation she describes as a state where you feel you can't do anything to change the world around you right i'm in my own isolated world atre is known isolated world we're both concerned about the state of the politics in the country today but you know we can't do anything to change it so we stay in our own particular places and you when you break that isolation that's when the possibility of change emerges right when two of us get together or in this or uh, or beyond two actually i mean two is just a very small metaphor but when more people get together that's the pub, that's the in a sense the birth of the public sphere and that's the birth of the possibility of politics and the birth of the possibility of change so it's very important to get together because that's when change becomes thinkable and then it becomes doable right so that's the uh, to me that is really the importance of the of the public sphere so and of course every again in uh, in the in the in the same uh, arentian kind of a framework uh every totalitarian state we want to break the issue of the public sphere and, and cultivate a sense of isolation so what is your challenge your challenge is then is how do you break that sense of isolation so that's why i think events such as this would become important events such as the pride marches would become important any kind of public space where people gather become important because that's where change becomes thinkable and hopefully do right we need to have these conversations as a really a starting point for any kind of a transformation any kind of a process of change and that maybe links to your first question because the entire question of uh, neoliberalism again to me the the heart of neoliberalism is really this right the idea that there is no alternative right the fact that we are in this we are stuck here and nothing can change right so we have to be able to uh, get forward at least in terms of the the optimism of the intellect the possibility that change can happen that's the starting point so i mean that's the point of beginning that kind of critique again i mean going back to the book i already referenced going back to piketty's book and capital and ideology that's one way where he's putting forward a possibility that another kind of world is possible places like the world social forum the idea that another kind of world is possible right so the idea uh, read again uh, naomi klein's work right another kind of world is possible so that's the starting point of thinking through alternate just alternatives to current status quo and we need to do that and so i think uh, it's very important to go with the idea that the critique of neoliberalism is alternatives are possible they have to start thinking of those alternatives um may i just add something to what arvind just said and uh, what shweta was saying earlier uh, you also spoke about assimilation and, and and the usefulness of certain kinds of uh, categories that tra- that translate and don't don't always translate very well or don't always translate effectively i'm reminded or as you were speaking uh, about edward said's formulation traveling theory um and theory travels um uncomfortably um in a topsy turvy uneven manner and um categories from you know the west is are kind of received not in a neat fashion 
they don't they're not transposed into these contexts of in the post colony in this kind of neat kind kind of build operate transfer kind of way uh, they they translate um, and transpose um, in in uneven kind of you know and and they're constantly changing as they transfer as they travel and that is the power of big ideas uh, universals if you if you like um but they but the the question then is do they always have to trans transfer do their place of origin or their particular origins do they always have to be the the metropole of the west and and the answer is i mean to me a resounding no that um that that we should we should um prefer a certain political definition um whereby our categories and concepts travel and travel um with difficulty with unsettledness um with you know it it like a, a lot of queer communities say that the word queer or the word lgbtqi or whatever doesn't capture their queerness well enough they have some indigenous term for it and an indigenous understanding of it though those are kind of the kind of translations and transpositions i'm talking about um and and these categories translate um imperfectly and within that imperfection um something generative something productive perhaps can be found the conversations make me think about this idea of um you know the philosophical idea of like hermeneutical injustice so before you actually know something is wrong you don't i mean space is also a forge you language to realize something that you have experienced as violence is violent right so it allows you to have meaning making in ways that are new and that's also shape shifting right so the reason we need these conversations in spaces and you know varying intersecting publics and people both borrowing terms and rejecting terms is because we need to have our own vocabulary but that vocabulary is sort of based on actually having conversations to recognize oh that is the thing i am right so someone who comes i mean my generation queer was not used in quite the same way that it's used in the next generation right like when you know i came out as queer like my mother wrote it on a post it and said k v e e r right like because it was the easiest way to pronounce the word and it was helpful right is that a tool is that not queer community like is that not doing the performance of what you expect but to know what a thing is requires you to walk into it with understandings of the word and i think one of the things that space especially um public spaces that allow you to be a participant without actively saying things right so you can be on a space like twitter and like learn what the conversations are allows you to come into violence and come into rights and come into this complex of what it is the language is that you're seeking to use differently and i think there's power in that like we don't we don't talk about that version of it too right which is some of us might know this vocabulary greatly right like if someone misgenders me or uses my pronouns like my immediate thought is not oh my god how dare you it is how do we have this conversation and open it up to like have a different version of coming to each other slightly differently and i think there's there's again possibility and optimism there i feel like that's the version that i'm doing on this panel i'm like when can we find the cake so that's that's the optimism um in in, in and i think that point by the simulation and and the contrast to that is the optimism it offers other questions please come to yeah, yeah. first of all thanks to the panel for this wonderful discussion uh so like when we speak of undoing normative conceptions of sexual and gendered life more so in the context of marriage gender gender is a performance it doesn't happen in isolation we have talked about it it needs someone and social norms that constitute our existence carry desires that do not originate with our individual personhood like hegelian uh, philosophy talks about it like being that it links with recognition claiming that desire is always a desire for recognition and when you experience recognition you become constituted as socially viable beings so like we are trying to be more human and uh, but that humanness itself is contested here like what it actually it is like if we don't adhere to that prescribed desire we are branded as less than humans and we desire recognition and our gender also is driven by the desire and would want recognition as well but schemes of this rec uh, recognition hold a power pattern and that we have been talking about so like my question my question is what if i don't want to be recognized in this set social norms first second and what is our relation with these social norms and even if we adhere to these who actually has the agency coming back to the idea of marriage 
like marriage norm as viability and social arrangement it falls into family we know and how practical it is to dissociate rights from marriage so that it remains a symbolic ex exercise in kinship thank you There's like seven questions in there. <laughs> like, um, wait, I'm assuming since I have the mic in my hand, I'm going to start. Okay. I love this idea of like desire as recognition, right? This interactional thing. You're bringing a new level of analysis that we haven't yet spoken about. We've spoken about the individual. We've spoken about the interactional. I mean, the institutional. And I really appreciate you bringing the interactional because it doesn't happen in vacuum, right? Like it's happening in conversation. It's happening in relationship. It's happening in community. Um, I, I, maybe I read this because I wanted to, but one of the things that I read from your question is what is the possibility for not wanting to be part of even the cool club, right? Like what, what is the point of like not even wanting to do desire in the way desire is done or, des or good desire is done or what, you know, like, like a bad feminist, what's a bad queer and like what, what does bad queerness look like and what does that performance look like? And I think you're right. I think you answered it right at the end, which is like, who has the agency in it? The agency has to be that self-fashioning. So the book talks about this idea of like, how do we recursively self-fashion ourselves that in ways that are authentic to just us. And that authenticity doesn't come out of like thin air. It comes out of actually, are you getting recognized? Is someone actually nodding when you say you're doing a, you know, your performance has to have somebody looking at it and they're reinforcing it if they give you a good nod and they're not reinforcing it if they sort of ignore it. And I think that Self, that is what the book calls self-fashioning, right? This is this idea of like you do the self because you assume you're going to be seen and unseen, right? Like queer markers of like, you know, hair or like I think of hair all the time because I think it's such an active queer marker, which, which sort of those of us that resisted it for so long sort of then just come on and say, oh my God, I'm so tired of like having to tell people I'm non-binary. I'm just going to cut my hair. They'll get it, right? And so which, which it shouldn't be. Like that seems like, and, and the resistance to it was exactly and I'm giving you like sort of personal narrative because I think it helps flesh out that question you're asking, which is resisting it takes so much work. One of the things we never talk about in queer politics and, and theory is how exhausting it is, right? No one talks about like how much work it is and how you need to take breaks from that exhaustion for your own mental safety, right? There's a lot of writing on like queer ethnographers especially have to like come into their own self because they are tired of constantly having to act and react and do desire and undo desire and make protective spaces. And so um, I appreciate you asking that question of like interactional logics, because I think your self-fashioning is dependent on your audience. And that audience is not a invisible market audience or like an, you know, or like a random family. It's actually everyday people you sit and talk to and who nod or don't nod and, and, and include you. So I really, I don't have an answer to your wonderfully nuanced question, but I think that's my reaction to it. <laughs> I think I just uh, echo what you just said that uh, thanks for that really, I think, very sophisticated question. And the way I, I understood it again, I think because so sophisticated, we'll all have just different interpretations of your thing. And you should be on, on the panel next time and speaking. That's really the way I put it. You know, you put for the, I think what I understood is you're drawing from Hegel to say that the desire for recognition is an important drive as far as all human beings are concerned, right? And what is the desire for recognition really? It's really to be constituted as, as you put it, as a socially viable being. So then that puts marriage in a completely different bracket, the way you're, 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 you're explaining it. Why do people want to get married? It's not necessarily for the entire question of just, you know, benefits, economic benefits. I, my partner lives here. I live in another country. Therefore, marriage helps us. But it is because I want to be recognized as a socially viable being. And that's the heart of the the, why marriage becomes so central and so important to a large number of people. But then, of course, you being as sophisticated as you are, saying, that's not who I am. There's another level, which is that there are people who don't want to be recognized by the social norms. What about these people? They don't want to be recognized by the social norms. What then? How do they fit within the marriage debate? And the answer to that would be, then you have to think, again, this has come up in many, many contexts, right? I'll give you the example of, say, Taiwan, which has same-sex marriage. The debate they had there is there's two versions of the bill which they, they didn't pass. They had drafts of. One was same-sex marriage, which says complete equality. Heterosexual marriage, uh, uh, same-sex marriage, both, every, any person can get married. And so that's, that's the law. The other version they moved is what they called a form of relationship recognition, which does away with the normativity of marriage, but does, deals with the, the things which concern a lot of people, right? I mean, if you're ill and you want your partner to take a decision, 
can your partner take a decision so can a partnership law guarantee that if can my partner inherit my property and these questions which a partnership law can deal with as well so i think the again going by your the logic we spoke about is if a queer politics is a broad tent which allows for a broad range of possibilities it should allow for marriage at one end and another end it must allow for relationship recognition which takes care of these various economic needs which people have and takes care of your point of getting recognized or getting constituted differently socially yeah uh, i just want to flip over your agency question into a power question so i don't have answers for your question but it just made me think that um sex or sexuality is as much an ecosystem of power as marriage is or as a uh, corporations are or governments are or any any other kind of kind of arrangements of power that we, that we might willingly or unwillingly participate in so uh, often in these kind of um, liberatory uh, narratives of of sexuality we forget that pa- power is not erased it just reconfigures itself and and and, and, and manifests itself in different languages and strategies but um, anybody who's who's um, you know sort of uh, going to kabul park on a sunday to to look for um you know a lover is uh is submitting to a possible um to, to the possibility of some form of you know rejection or um ignoring or whatever all kinds of things that that come with participation in the sexual economy um what agency then that that's that's the question i'll i'll put to you like we are so proud of this word agency i'm a little bit tired of it um it's it's a it takes away it it distracts us from our willing everyday participation in economies of power including those of sexuality yeah hi uh so thank you for the discussion and i had a question relating name? ishika <laughs> okay uh so I had a question relating to um the politics of recognition again marriage essentially being an being a politics of recognition through the state and a lot of assertions of demo, of any marginalized community being rooted in seeking that kind of recognition a politics of presence essentially and um is there in that context and when we see the new liberal state usurping all kinds of movements is there what is the point of the politics of presence and especially with queerness where the politics of presence of the hijra community a lot of ftm people are going to say that it has been exclusionary to other kinds of trans people that the assertion of cis gay and cis lesbian women has been exclusionary to other kinds of trans people so given that queerness in my view should be about dismantling the system what do you do about the the problem of assertion and the politics of presence that is necessary in movement building uh because how do you build a movement that is supposed to dismantle without that first assertion and that's kind of the conflict that i see what do we do with what is a queer politics supposed to look like if it's trying to balance this politics of presence thing that's going to be exclusionary because queerness is not supposed to be a definable category um yeah <laughs> you know you know these questions are so great like they're just stumping us to thinking about like i'm i'm, I'm like outlining my next paper in this this is fascinating um the poli- so so you're actually elevating a question that social movement theorists have asked forever right which is how do you actually make something that is about categories non categorical to club together to make something that's a whole and what i was stumped listening to your question is how you actually queer that for the queer space which is fabulous right because you're actually saying social movements do this but it's particularly hard for queers because so much of queerness is about not being present but also we need presence right which is it's so meta right now like i'm having this like loopiness in my head it's it's fabulous um again i don't think i don't i'm trying to i'm going to assume that none of you actually want like question answers that just give you actual answers that you can take home because queerness is not about answers it's about questions expanding onto themselves i think in some sense um but to to go back to your point i think 
part of this is recognizing that there are different audiences to go back to the last question, right? There are audiences where that presence and exclusion and inclusion is important. And then there are audiences where leverages that happen within the movement take into account larger movement goals. And, and, and it's sort of that, but that, but I think the problem with that is that those larger movement goals are necessarily going to have costs and the people who bear the costs are necessarily going to be inflicted by power, right? And I think that's true for all movements, but it's particularly hard for queer movements because so much of that movement building has been about being ulterior, right? And, and, um, one of the books I've really enjoyed over the last couple of years is Ratna Kapoor's, uh, freedom, you know, the, the idea of like, freedom and fishbowls and this like industrial complex of rights that we've built up, right? And social movements seem to assume that rights are where our freedom is going to be. And like, so Kapoor offers that actually the real liberation project happens outside of rights. Because if you think about rights, right? So if the movement only cared about outcomes, and I think of rights as an outcome, it's not doing the work that you needed to do. Like real liberation requires you to think about freedom truly outside. So to your point, we need to break this down. And part of the breaking down needs to be in ways that hold community for each other. And we sort of do that to the outside audience, but I don't do, we do, I don't think we do enough of that to each other. And I think that's the space where I think movement building has to pay more care and do critique with more love and possibility and optimism rather than, you know, I can't believe you said that I'm canceling you. Right. Right. Because that, that's truly how we're, we're making movements smaller and smaller. And the only people winning are the people who are not outside of the movements. That's already part of the mainstream. Again, I gave you no answers, but I just wanted to, to, to respond by saying I love the question and it's making me think about the queerness of movements, not just as a category, but as a meta theoretical project. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again for that, uh, to echo you, the, that really great question. And the way I understood it again, I think we all have very different interpretations of the way the, the, your, your question itself. I thought one part of the question was, uh, how the politics of presence dictates who might get benefits or might get recognition from the state. And the way you phrase it is the trans, that in the transgender community, the history community might be more visible, whereas the, 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 uh, the female to male community might be less visible. So some of the sometimes the benefits could be unfairly cornered by one grouping over another grouping. I mean unfairly in terms of within that subgrouping as it were. But again, using your metaphor, that's a question of politics anywhere. Look at the entire question of the within the Dalit context, the entire question of sub reservation. Again, the point that you know, what about the marginalized Dalit groupings? Uh, who are not getting the benefits of reservation as it were. So what is the way forward in this context of, you know, of uh, one grouping getting the benefits which are ideally meant for everybody else, you know? One way of phrasing it, of course, is can you, even if you frame the benefit one is referring to in a universal sense, does it mean that everybody can access that particular benefit? So again, going back to the marriage question, if again going back since I think a little bit like a like a lawyer, if you if you articulate, for example, I mean, of course, we take the critique of marriage question, the relationality question, but if you go within the mainstream institution itself, and if you just use the language, if you change the language of the Special Marriage Act to just say person and person, right? And person is a category which includes everybody within it. It doesn't matter who you are, you are included within that particular grouping. So one way forward in terms of this uh, constant kind of a division and subdivision among, among groups, and there'll always be hierarchies, always be hierarchies within different kinds of groups, is to phrase the, phrase the, the benefit or the recognition in a universal sense, which means everybody can access it theoretically. I'm not saying everybody can access it materially and necessarily. So that's still a question or a product of struggle, and that's a question of the future. That's, that's one part of the answer. But the second point, which I just want to quickly respond to, since also we, we are saying that, you know, uh, we come in a sense from different contexts, is the, the, the Ratna Kapoor point on rights, right? I would make the case that we'd see rights as a product of struggle, right? And I would say that you know, I'll go back in a sense to both what? as a product of struggle. I'll go back to both uh, in, in, in the Indian context, in the human rights movement, I'll go back to both Balgopal and Kanabaran who make that point, that you know, we see rights as a product of struggle, we see the constitution and the guarantee of the right to equality or the right to freedom from practice of untouchability as again a product of struggle, right? So that's again a, a right which is there in the abstract. 
It's a right which is concretized to some extent through social movements. And that's the path down which we would go. And again, to quote Balgopal again, he said that rights are the moral memory of mankind. Right? And so we'd see it in that context. Time for a last question, maybe? Yeah, we do. Yeah, sure, please start. Hello, um, I'm Jitta. Uh, I think I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna stick to two. And they will, well, like two, and I don't know if they have anything to do with each other, but I feel like in this discussion, you guys have moved from personal stories to examples and historical movements to like law and legislature so you're like moving between very different spheres <laughs> and i was wondering i really like what you were talking about earlier when it came to emotion the role of emotion and care and maybe even tenderness when it comes to critique i'd love to hear like opinions on that but also because i'm pretty sure you all work in similar or very different fields like activism law academia i wanted to talk about the emo like the role of emotion in maybe queer as method rather than queer as person queer as method is not just being but research love for that like was one ex like one question you can talk about it if you want to or even and then something that's slightly a little bit of a tangent but maybe this the limitations of language because a lot of the questions we're hearing about is how words tend to group people. And I love that comparison earlier about like Dalit marginalized groups versus uh, not being able to represent a person depending on where they are on like a queer sphere. I love that comparison, but I'm just seeing like a limitation of language. And I was wondering if you had opinions on that. I, I don't, I, I want to talk the first question, which sort of, I think I took us down that care as critique uh, loop. And it's actually a poignant question because it's all I think about. Like I think about like this idea of like how to think of care as, how to think of care as critical, care as critique, and critique as careful, right? Like how do we actually do it truly with care for the other and for ourselves? And I think the second part sometimes gets lost in a lot of methodology. So I'm, writing a piece on like being an auntie in the field and what does it mean for a non-binary person to be read as an auntie and when do you say actually I use they them pronouns I'd like you know going to your question about language right actually that's not your place you're literally there as a person in the field doing research and and, and your body is queer method in a sense and I'm happy to share that you know more theory on that logic to you but I want to bring it up because I think there's something there about emotion is queer method and and um I think about it in my book is like agoraphobia, right? Part of being queer is constantly looking at places and being like, oh my God, I'm really overwhelmed by all the different things I could be and I'm not, right? So there's, you know, the, the, the logic of queer failure, the art of queer failure is constantly comparing yourself to other things, falling short about things you don't even want to be part of, and then feeling terrible for having fallen short about the things you don't want to be part of anyway, right? And I think that gets worked into method in writing, that gets worked into method in the way you are doing research, that gets, I mean, I'm a sociologist by training, but I'm a law professor, so I, it sort of it comes up in the way I teach, it comes up in the way I get emotional in classes, right, pedagogy, going back to the point about pedagogy, so there are all these different ways in which it doesn't get left at the door, it's an inherent part of all sorts of things, and all of that is care, all of that is critique, right, people actually thinking of critique as Anger is the starting point for where we need to walk back from. Like, how can care and love and joyful community building be critique? And how can that be critical to our movement? Is sort of, um, that might, if that's the last thing I say, it'll be a productive last careful thing to say. But thank you for that question. Yeah, again, thank you for the question. And uh, on the question of critique itself, perhaps go back to one of uh, the inspirations of the book, which is, I uh, you just mentioned it is Foucault and the idea, idea of governmentality. But there's another, again, if you get a chance, there's a really beautiful essay by Foucault, where he talks about the question of critique and criticism, right? And he says, I mean, when people say, I destroyed this person in the argument, it's a horrible image which comes before your eye, right? 
uh, before your eyes when you see that somebody is like you know have destroyed you in argument it's really horrible i mean that, that can't be the world you want to live in and he says this judgmentality seems to be the heart of what we think of because when he says when the when the world ends finally there'll be a there'll be a question where the two people i will be judging you for what happened in the world till now he says but that's not the kind of critique which he believes in right and he says give to me the kind of critique which makes the form and the way of dance which uh, which makes the which makes the grass sing which multiplies signs of life and existence right and uh, that's the kind of critique i want right and so you think of it again that right? critique is about again the what we're discussing about liberating possibilities right it's not again the, i like the way going back to the way you framed the book right you said you you said and you're right you're saying that you know you're being a little ungenerous right? ungenerous to the reading of the book no 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 I, you I, that's what i took from it and i think it's a fair point right because i mean the point of you know how do you take something right how do you construct something new how do you take something forward and that's i think a nice way to look at anything so i i took that from the conversation so thank you for that i put it that way rather than <laughs> any other way and the second question about the question of language and the limits of language i would put it differently and see maybe we should look at the possibilities of language right what does language enable rather than what is what is language limit right and perhaps for this my inspiration will be going back to the nas foundation judgment 2009 where uh, justice shah quotes uh, nehru in the constituent assembly debate right and nehru puts it i think the, the phrase he uses is, is sometimes the magic of words is not enough to capture the intensity of a nation's passion or its future right and so the magic of words is what he gestures to right and i think in some ways i mean the magic of words can be in the most prosaic of language right uh, for me the magic of words could be for example in the concepts such as dignity which speaks to a range of you know experiences of humiliation of diverse communities around the world it could be in the language of the universality by which i mean the fact that you know everybody is entitled to the right to equality right nobody can be denied the right to equality right so the range of ways in which again going back to the, my my thematic the way in which uh, humorous language can actually speak the language of hope and aspiration and possibility i just want to echo that and say uh, language is often seen in two register long and far away right long is the um, l a n g u i d u e uh is the register in which like you see grammar or like the rules and and whatever the set, set in stone kind of language and then there is bahol which is the language uh circulates in the labyrinthine world of the of society of desire of what have you and and it becomes another different thing and that is where i think the possibilities of language are far greater than limitations um yeah i might say that uh, i'm just thinking of you know when we teach children handwriting they see the same alphabet on the on the board or in their in their picture book but they all write it differently and that's where that's where the kind of like the um the mitis of language kind of lies there for me right um yeah thank you for all your questions thank you for listening to us tonight and thank you panelists for this wonderful set of arguments and counter arguments and yeah. all of that care as critique that's our punchline for the night i will call it tonight thank you thank you everyone bye